Welcome to The Well. I am Brandon Edgens. And I am Anson Mount. And on today's episode, we are going to jump into a scientific subject. Sometimes people don't realize that science is creative. It is a creative process because otherwise, without creativity, where do you start asking questions? You know, when we first looked up at the stars, we wondered, are they holes in the sky? Are they the campfires of gods? You know, these are questions. And then you go from there. You observe and do experiments. What we're going to tackle today is a lot more difficult to fathom than just stars. Those That was hard. And this is hard too, but we'll get through it together. <laughs> um, but luckily, we have a special guest who is going to help us understand this stuff. And Anson, you found Daniel for us, and I, I don't want to talk. I don't want to reveal <laughs> how he came to your attention. I want people to go back and do their homework and f- figure this out for themselves. Right. But how did you? But how did you fear hear that story? It was a news piece um, that uh, had come out about uh, some trouble that Daniel got into during the pandemic, and uh, I just thought it made a great fun episode that uh it turned out at the end we found out that that daniel had kind of called the press attention on himself even though it was very embarrassing to give people to something to laugh at during the pandemic and i just thought that that was that was really awesome and yeah, that spoke and spoke a lot to his character exactly and and he was such I, I didn't do that original interview with you because you surprised me with that one uh from that for that episode you kind of sprung it on me and got my reaction it was great because it's a hysterical story and he was very very charming and very well spoken and i immediately wanted to talk to him more uh myself and then it turns out he is an astrophysicist incredibly smart (laughs) incredibly smart guy and then i i emailed him a long time ago saying can we kind of retain you as our unofficial science advisor for our podcast and he was really up for it and uh, then this subject came up that i was interested in the subject of today's subject of gravity waves and yeah. so I got in touch with Daniel and have, and Daniel's going to help us understand this incredibly interesting, new and exciting field in astrophysics. My name is Daniel Reardon. I'm an astrophysicist at Swinburne University in Melbourne, Australia. And what I study is radio astronomy. I use radio telescopes to observe these special stars called pulsars. And we do lots of uh, exciting science for them, including searching for low-frequency gravitational waves. Daniel is a lead researcher on gravity waves. And what are gravity waves? Well, we should probably start off with the basics. What is gravity? I think of gravity as the way Einstein's theory tells us, which is that it's kind of like a fabric. If you place mass in this fabric, it distorts and bends. There's this example where you think of a a sheet of fabric, like a trampoline or something like that, and you place something heavy on it, like a bowling ball, it creates this dip. And if you grab another ball and place it on the trampoline, it's going to roll towards the bowling ball, right? It's attracted to it because of this distortion. Well, that's how we understand gravity today. But just a few centuries back, people's explanation for gravity was a lot more prosaic. People ascribed volition and desires to everyday objects. So people thought that things fell to the earth because they wanted to be closer to the earth. And then along came Sir Isaac Newton, who, while hiding out from the plague in the late 1600s, defined and described gravity like this. Uh, A body with mass is attracted to another body with mass um, with some force. And uh, that force gets stronger with uh, the inverse square of the distance. It turns out that behavior described the orbits of the planets in the solar system, for example. And the math worked very, very well, and for a long time. But all of his equations just had the constant g in it. Uh, No value. Newton did not know the value of g, and it would not be found for over another 100 years. And I asked Daniel, who solved it? How'd he do it? I don't remember, actually. (laughs) (laughs) That was the part. You know, it's funny. In my notes, I wrote a blank there. I'm like, Daniel will definitely know this one. (laughs) (laughs) 
So at the time, Daniel simply couldn't remember who solved for G, so he kindly looked it up for us and sent me the answer. And since this is going to be a bit of a sidebar, I am going to go over to my AI music generating program. This is Music LM from Google, and I'm going to ask it to write 18th century harpsichord science experiment music. Yeah, so this is my favorite textbook, Gravitation. Uh, it's by Charles Meisner, Kip Thorne, John Archibald Wheeler. And it says, okay, see any standard textbook for a description of the Cavendish experiment. Right. Okay, so, it's not bad, hold on. Okay, I'm gonna check this one. This is more um, university physics. It's more like the book that I used when I was an undergrad, but there's a nice uh, diagram of the torsion balance. Oh my god, that's gonna make me kill somebody. Back to Daniel. I'm sorry I did that. Yeah, so Cavendish had this uh, torsion balance with two masses on this wire, and he placed lead spheres very close to these um, small masses, and the gravitational attraction of these lead spheres pulled uh, ever so slightly this this torsion balance in the direction of those lead spheres and he was able to measure the twist in the wire since the gravitational force of the earth on the small ball could be measured directly that's just by weighing it uh the ratio of the two forces the earth and the attraction to this lead ball uh gives the relative density of the earth he solved for the mass of the earth and also the gravitational constant so Henry Cavendish should be as well known as Newton and Einstein, but he's not, and he would probably like it that way because he was a kind of an odd man. Uh, a colleague of his at the time described him as suffering from a degree of shyness that bordered on disease. We actually plan on doing an entire future episode on Henry Cavendish because I find him that interesting, and we'll have Daniel back on to help out with that. So Henry Cavendish calculated the Earth's density to within 1% of its accepted value today. He also calculated the mass and he solved for the gravitational constant, all by his lonesome back in 1798. Not bad. And what is the gravitational constant, you ask? Well, it is 6.754 times 10 to the power of negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. That doesn't feel right. Does it feel like 6.754 to you? Oh, no, that was where he was a little bit wrong. It's not, I knew something was wrong. This is not 6.754. The modern updated gravitational constant is 6.67, 10 times to the power of negative 11 Newton meters squared per kilogram squared. I knew it was off. So Henry Cavendish had these two giant lead balls hanging on one wire. And all he's measuring is how much that wire twists at the top because it's an imperceptible movement. These two okay. balls, he's kind of a dumbbell, you know, they're rotating, they're balanced like a mobile. They're rotating a little bit. And that movement is so infinitesimally small. And you, years ago, for an episode we have not figured out how to tackle yet, visited a laborato uh, laboratory. It was in Toronto? Oh, yeah, yeah, in Ottawa. In Ottawa, right? And yeah. wh and what were they doing there? Um, it was the National Science Re uh, National Science Research Facility <laughs> in Ottawa. Uh, they had and uh, they were one of the few teams in the world who had had made the Kibble Balance, which was a, a um, theoretical instrument devised by a guy named Kibble to measure the natural constant for a kilogram, because right now. The kilogram is just this thing sitting in a vault in France, uh, or it was, uh, that everything was weighed against. Uh, and 
until we made an, a natural constant or figured out a natural constant for the kilogram. Incredibly difficult thing to do. It, this thing had to measure, do like 12 measurements in, at the same time, including the gravitational force in the room at the moment that the, the measurement was being taken. Uh, and I went and I interviewed the team uh, that, that made this happen and uh, uh, arguably had the best results of any team on the planet. That's amazing. But remember, even though gravity, we don't really, we're not aware of it. We're not conscious of it usually until you like fall down the stairs or something. But normally you don't think about it. It's, and what we don't think about is the fact that everything has just a little, a little bit of gravity, just a tiny oh. infinitesimal amount. And that's the problem when you're trying to get an incredibly accurate measurement. Is that yeah, and so tell me they, about how they kept their weird yeah, results. Yeah, they, they kept getting weird results for a while, and they were, un, they were underground, right, to have really stable uh, foundation for this balance. And they kept getting these weird results until they realized that they had not accounted. They, they were getting normal results, and then after a few months, they started getting weird results, and they couldn't figure it out until they realized the only thing that it had changed is that it had snowed. And the gravitational force of the like two feet of snow above them was pulling the measurement off. It was that sensitive. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. But it, but, but it demonstrates you know something that we don't think about, which is that all mass has some gravity, but usually so small you can't. But two feet of snow managed to throw off, managed to pull their instrument slightly upwards. That's yeah. insane. So we are now at the point of the story where the value of G is solved, but people still thought of G as a wave, right? And it had to propagate as something like heat or sound, right? It has to travel as something. So from Newton's time until the late 19th century, scientists get totally sidetracked with looking for this pervasive substance they called the luminiferous ether or light bearing because it carried the light and we spent a very very long time looking for the luminiferous ether so light must have something that it travels through and we also traveled through this medium called the ether and so if light is traveling through this medium in some direction we would observe light going faster if we're traveling against the flow of light in that medium and we would observe light to be traveling slower if we're traveling with light, right? It would, it would not escape us as fast. This is what the infamous Michelson-Morley experiment of 1886 was all about. The idea was to use an interferometer, which is a device that sends light beams out in perpendicular directions, bounces them off a mirror, and then recombines them just to see if they come back at the same time because if it didn't, it would indicate something disturbing or slowing down their transit through space. In other words, it's using two light beams to measure each other. Now remember that bit. It's important later. Anyway, back to the Michelson-Morley experiment. Because light was going through this ether, um, we thought that as the Earth goes around the sun and changes its direction, there's going to be some point where the Earth is moving past, oh, against light in the ether. And then six months later, when the Earth is going in the other direction, it's traveling with the light. And so we would observe the speed of light change as a function of the year, as the Earth's velocity changes through the ether. It's using the changing velocity of the Earth uh, to measure changes in the speed of light uh, through, the, through the ether. And of course, they didn't find anything. They observed no changes to the speed of light because the ether doesn't exist. But it's hard to let go of a beloved theory, so there were a lot of attempts by scientists at the time to explain why the ether could not be found. My favorite was proposed by George Francis Fitzgerald, who proposed that the measuring instruments themselves were shrunk in proportion to the thing that you were trying to measure by the ether. So it nullified your results. In other words, it really couldn't be measured. It was part of an idea called length contraction. Clever, no? And despite it being completely wrong, 
it actually fed into Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, everyone has some novel other way of trying to explain the very non-intuitive concept of relativity. I sort of collect these metaphors. Here's Daniel, though, with one I haven't heard before. So there's this experiment where you consider um, a train moving very quickly past an observer. And on this train, there is a clock with a photon of light bouncing between two, two levels. And so the clock ticks when the photon hits the top and then it ticks again when it hits the bottom and this repeats. And so you can imagine a clock like that. If you're on the train with this clock, you see that the photon just goes up and down at the speed of light and it's very uh, intuitive to understand the ticking of that clock. Now, if the train is moving extremely quickly and you're an observer stationary watching this train go past, when you follow the photon of this um, clock upwards, it actually uh, travels in a sort of triangular or sawtooth shape because it's moving up and down through the clock, but then the clock is moving sideways, right? And so the path of this photon moves in this triangular pattern. And so the path length is longer. And if the speed of light is constant, the clock ticks slower. So what else could stretch a photon's path through space-time? Well, a dense gravitational body like a pulsar or a quasar. Or the big daddy of them all, black holes. Or how about two black holes orbiting each other? They're emitting energy in the form of gravitational waves, just like those first neutron stars um, that were observed to provide the first indirect evidence. The black holes are doing that too. So every orbit, they're losing some energy due to gravitational waves. They don't have the, uh, the energy to sustain that orbit. They get closer and closer and closer. We know that the black hole has some event horizon, which is the point at which um, light can't escape anymore. And so these black holes with their event horizons just get closer and closer together until they touch and they merge into a larger black hole. We see that they start spinning faster and faster and faster. The gravitational waves get louder and louder until all of a sudden they merge. And there's this small ring down period where when the black holes touch, they're not suddenly another sphere, which is a black hole. They're sort of this, um, like a dumbbell shape. They've got these, you know, the two separate event horizons and then they touch and it's kind of a dumbbell shape. That still emits gravitational waves. It's still emitting um, this so-called ring down period. After they've collided, there's a, a few oscillations where this black hole goes from being a dumbbell into a sphere. And so during that period, it emits gravitational waves, but they die off very quickly. And then we're just left with a new black hole, which is a stationary sphere, and it's no no longer uh, emitting gravitational waves. Right. It'd be a little bit like a paddle spinning in water, and then it, the paddles shrink into a into a sphere, and now the, a sphere, a spinning sphere, does not produce waves. Yeah, exactly. So far, this is mostly theory. If gravity can bend space time, as Einstein guessed and he was very good at guessing, that gravity would have waves too, and it would distort space-time as it traveled through space. It was just a theory, and it would remain a theory until we found some way to test it. But the problem is that gravitational waves are so small that even Einstein didn't think we would ever be able to actually observe them. So, how do you go about measuring something that is best measured in distances of light years. Do you have any light year long yardsticks laying around? I mean, you would need super accurate stopwatches placed throughout the galaxy to give you a sense of what space time was doing in between all of those empty spaces. Such a thing couldn't possibly exist. I mean, how convenient would that be? If you asked a physicist what their ideal laboratory was to test general relativity and to test um, quantum mechanics at these extreme densities, they would say, hey, okay, let's take a very precise clock and let's put it orbiting in a very 
dense gravitational field. And that's what a pulsar is. It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. And how lucky for us that, that these things exist. Um, I have a kind of the, something that's always baffled me a little bit about pulsars is, um, well, first of all, they're, well, I'll let you, I'll let you explain what a pulsar is in the first place. Yeah. So a pulsar is a, a neutron star. It's the core that's left over from a massive star that has exploded. So when, when stars that are five or more times the mass of the sun, uh, come to the end of their life, they run out of the fuel that supports them, uh, against gravity. And so gravity starts to win and they collapse into this very dense object. Most of the star explodes, but there's a, a core left over, which is uh, only about 20 kilometers across, maybe 10 miles across. <laughs> um, and it weighs one and a half times the mass of the sun. So that is such an incredible density. It's, it's like taking a teaspoon of that matter. It would weigh as much as Mount Everest. It's just incredible. You can't picture these densities, but it's so compact that the magnetic uh, the magnetic field also becomes very very strong, and just like a, a figure skater who's spinning around, when the figure skater pulls their arms in, they spin around very very quickly. These pulsars had the momentum of the star compressed down into this uh, twenty kilometer ball, and so they spin very very quickly as well. So because of that, they're these very dense objects that have a very stable uh, spin. And the magnetic field, which is super powerful, emits beams of radio waves as it accelerates charged particles through these, through these um, fields. So this star that's spinning with these beams of radio waves, if these beams happen to be pointing towards our Earth, we observe a pulse of light. So that's what a pulsar is. That was my question, um, and of course you just and you just answered it. Was the assumption? I mean, in order for it to be of use to us, those poles have to be pat aimed at us at some point. Well, wow. so there's probably a lot of pulsars out there that aren't oriented in our direction and are pointing in ways that we can't. They're not sending beams our way. So exactly. Okay, that was just I'm making sure I understood that. So we observe pulsars that are in an orbit with other neutron stars. And so those other neutron stars, they're just like the pulsar. They should have very powerful magnetic fields that should be spinning very quickly. Um, and so we expect them probably to have uh, radio beams, a lot of them, but they're just not pointed towards us. There is one special system where there is a, a pulsar orbiting another neutron star and that other neutron star was observed as a pulsar. It's the only known double pulsar system and it's an incredible test of general relativity. So it's, it's enabled some of the most precise tests of general relativity in the strong field where we had these two clocks orbiting each other um, in a two and a half hour orbit. They were very close together and every two and a half hours they spin around and they're emitting gravitational waves so we can measure that and we can study all kinds of effects. Um, the second pulsar is actually no longer a pulsar. And the reason is because of general relativity. So general relativity predicts how space time is distorting in this double pulsar system. And the pulsar has actually processed out of the line of sight. So the beam was pointing towards our earth, but general relativity made this pulsar um, process move uh, in its orbit and it changed the beam and the beam is no longer pointing towards us. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but that would also suggest that at some point, any, at any time, I don't know, another one could rotate into exactly uh, into orientation with us and another one could appear. What's the name of that system? Uh, it's called the double pulsar system. It it's has only a, one? Yes, it's, it's the only one. It's... Um, I mean, we hope to find more, but yes, it, it's an incredible system. It's um, yeah, the only one discovered so far. Uh, it has a another name called J0737 minus 3039A and B. <laughs> oh, that one. Why did you just say that first? Yeah, of course. Everyone knows that one. <laughs> so, 
Providence was kind enough to scatter these very accurate stopwatches throughout the galaxy. And we can use them sort of the same way that security cameras and convenience stores use those height charts that they set up by the door just so they can triangulate the height uh, of escaping thieves. So these ultra low frequency gravitational waves, we measure them using a detector almost the size of our galaxy, where we're measuring the change in distances between two or more arms of a detector, except now the arms of the detector go from our observatories on the Earth out to pulsars in the distant galaxy. So these pulsars can be thousands of light years away. And we use those splashes to time the arrival times of the pulses and produce a very precise model of the relative distances and motions of the Earth and the pulsar. So anything that can delay the pulse on its way, on its way from the pulsar to our telescope, we can measure and, and model. And gravitational waves are included. So as a gravitational wave passes over the Earth, it's stretching and squeezing space-time, which is then moving the pulsar towards and away from our observatory. And we measure that in time delays of the pulses. We monitor these pulsars over decades. Um, we've had an experiment in Australia that's been going since 2004. Uh, so, yeah, almost 20 years we've been looking at these pulsars. And what we're searching for are changes in the arrival times of a millionth of a second. That's, that's the effect of gravitational waves over these decade time scales. The evidence that we've seen so far is for this just random background of gravitational waves coming from every direction in the sky. So the signal appeared slowly in these pulsar data sets because the periods are you know, tens of years long, meaning that they're ultra low frequencies. And so it takes a long time for this signal to slowly build in the data. We're now at the point where we can say, there's gravitational waves here. It, this signal looks and feels exactly like a gravitational wave. It has this fingerprint that we expect gravitational waves to look like on our data. I, ha I had no idea how long it, it took to gather this data. That's why they've been gathering it for so long. It just takes a very long time for the signal to sort of emerge out of all the background noise. And it would be something kind of like a geologist who had to study erosion by just watching it and waiting for it to happen. But that's actually a lot easier because those are very relatively much faster events, erosion and happening over distances that are much, much easier to measure than the stuff Daniel and his team are trying to measure. For the impatient, there had to be a faster way. Something that could detect gravity waves created by major gravitational events like two supermassive black holes spinning into each other and colliding. A high-energy wave should be detectable by a ground-based instrument using interferometers. Remember those, like the ones that didn't measure the ether and the Michelson-Morley experiment? So we made two of these devices called LIGO, both with four kilometer arms arranged perpendicular to each other to see if we could measure if one arm grew or shrank a little bit. This is the LIGO experiment, which found direct evidence of gravitational waves back in 2017. It is the most sensitive measuring device ever made because what it is trying to detect is very, very small. And when I say very small, if the ruler was from your hand to Alpha Centauri, then you're looking for something along the, uh, uh, the width of a human hair as your signal. So w we think of space as some material, actually, this, like this fabric we talked about. Um, so it can stretch and squeeze. But when you think of other materials like steel or rubber or something, we think about the stiffness of that material. So how much energy does it take to stretch it and squeeze it, right? Uh, it takes a lot of energy to stretch uh, steel if you wanted to do that. But space is way stiffer than steel. It's like incredibly, uh, incredibly difficult to stretch and squeeze it. It takes a lot of energy, uh, such as the orbits of black holes. And so 
Uh, yeah, the, the gravitational waves that were observed by LIGO, they changed the length of these four kilometer laser arms by something like a thousandth the width of a proton, which, yeah, we can't think about it. We know it's really, really small. The gravitational waves that we have observed evidence for using pulsars, they're much, much, much louder. They're much stronger than the gravitational waves observed by LIGO, but they're still incredibly tiny. So as I said, these pulsars are somewhere in the distant galaxy that can be a thousand light years away, but we're looking for changes in the arrival times that are a millionth of a second that corresponds to just hundreds to a thousand feet, even though these, these pulsars are a thousand light years away. But of course, you need to have some intuitive understanding of what a light year is in order to understand that. It's small. It's really small. Less than a photon. Notice we have not tried to describe the effects of gravitational waves yet. I waited until now because this is where the effect may be the most relevant to the LIGO experiment. Gravity is such a fundamental force that when it gets distorted and creates a wave, the effect is weird. Every atom it passes through, let's say your body, every atom in your body, will shrink and skew and grow and collapse a little bit. It's happening at the subatomic level, though, so you won't feel it. If gravitational waves are shrinking the arm of the measuring stick and gravitational waves affects everything, would it not also affect the light itself? Would it not shrink and alter the length of the light beam and the tube and negate your experiment? Isn't this how George Francis Fitzgerald explained how the ether shrank the instrument in proportion to the thing being measured? Well, kinda. The solution? This is hard to explain, but basically the laser is constantly pulsing and taking new measurements. And if one of the pulses travels a greater distance than the one before it, then there's a good chance that space-time was warped in the preceding measurement or something like that. So we found gravitational waves. So what? From the high frequency waves caused by things like pulsars that create a constant slow ripple in the ocean of space-time to the big low frequency rogue waves caused by merging black holes, we now know gravitational waves exist. We've proved it. So what can we do with this knowledge? This is a new set of tools to explore the universe. It used to be just photons and telescopes and what we could see with our eyes. Then it was electromagnetic waves and radio telescopes. Now we have something, for the first time since the late 60s, that is just brand new. We can see further in distance, therefore, further in time. But as we refine our observations, we will start to see individual black hole systems or individual sources of gravitational waves, which might not be black holes. There might be something else out there, mm -hmm. um, like cosmic strings or um, you know, gravitational field ripples from the very early universe. We figure out what this background is, and then when we keep observing, we generate this more precise map of where the gravitational waves come from. So at the moment, we just say that it's it's isotropic. It looks the same everywhere. But in the near future, we might we might see that actually there's some hot spot in the sky, there seems to be more gravitational waves from this direction than this direction. And then we refine that further and we say, actually, there's gravitational waves coming from precisely this spot. Or we might look at uh, using our Hubble or um, James Webb Space Telescopes, and we might see that there's a galaxy there. And we'll say, okay, there's supermassive black holes in that galaxy. And that will be incredible, but this is a, a distant future sort of gravitational wave astronomy uh, dream of mine. <laughs> well, what would it mean um, in terms of our understanding of the universe, how it's formed and where it's going? We think that the background is isotropic because it's dominated by the supermassive black holes in the very distant universe. And we know that when we look out into the universe, um, if you look out just a short distance, you start to see a galaxy here, a galaxy here, it's very clumpy and it looks different wherever you look. But the further and further out you look, 
you start to see hundreds of billions of galaxies. Um, and so the universe starts to look the same in every direction. Uh -huh. So if there's just some random distribution of supermassive black hole binaries, then the further out in the universe you look, the more of these systems you'll find. And so the stronger the gravitational waves will be, but also the more isotropic it looks. It doesn't matter which direction you look, you're still going to see you know, hundreds or thousands of these binary black hole systems. Measuring anisotropy and measuring individual supermassive black hole systems, these yeah. feed into our knowledge of the formation history of the universe and of galaxies in the, in the universe. So this comes back to this, you know, um, science being a creative pursuit um, that, that you described earlier. This cosmology is the study of the very early universe and how the universe evolved through um, early times to the, to the present day. And this is about creativity. It's about understanding origins and, you know, how the universe came to be from the Big Bang to now. And supermassive black holes are a key ingredient of that because supermassive black holes lie at the center of every medium to large size galaxy in the universe. And what they do is they feed on gas. So gas in the galaxy falls onto these black holes and they emit huge amounts of energy, enough energy to completely stop star formation in the whole galaxy. Mm -hmm. And so understanding the black holes and this feedback mecha mechanism where they take in gas and they, they stop star formation, that's an essential ingredient of our understanding of the formation history of the universe. So nanohertz frequency gravitational waves, these ultra low frequency gravitational waves, they are um, really the best uh, way we can observe these, uh, these supermassive black hole systems uh, because mostly they're solitary, like the one in our galaxy. Well, right. And so we can't see them unless they are actively feeding on gas and emitting lots of um, lots of energy. We call those active galactic nuclei. So we can study them that way. But this binary population is important for understanding how often galaxies uh, merge together to form a bigger galaxy, how quickly the black holes sink into the core, um, and whether or not those black holes are accelerated through this gravitational wave emission phase by passing stars and gas in, in the galaxy. So there's lots we can learn about the interiors of the galaxies through these uh, gravitational waves and um, yeah, everything from the supermassive black hole itself from the environments and how often the galaxies collide and so on. It, 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 things like that, uh, the galaxies colliding, supermassive black holes spinning into each other, there's some kind of predictable time frame or uh, that, that we expect this to happen. So by using that, that becomes another kind of clock. So we have theories that can predict that. And so that gives us a range of the amplitude and frequencies of these low frequency gravitational waves that we expect. But you can only get so far with that prediction. You've got to go and measure it. <laughs> so that's what, we've, that's what we're, we're now seeing. We're seeing evidence for these low frequency gravitational waves. If they are due to supermassive black holes, we can immediately start testing these ideas and feed that back into those simulations that made the predictions. What excites you? What sort of ultimate mysteries might all this solve? The way I dream of this playing out, this um, signal growth with time and our, our, our knowledge, <laughs> is that we've seen a background. It was what roughly what we expected and in my view is probably due to gravitational waves from these supermassive black hole binaries. But then I expect there to be unknowns, which is the really exciting part. Um, so we could see more exotic sources of gravitational waves. So for example, cosmic strings, which are these incredible objects formed in the very early universe. They're topological defects in space that are very, very thin and have lots and lots of mass and energy, and they wriggle and wrap around and form these loops. And these loops, as they move, they produce gravitational waves. And we can measure those with pulsar timing data. Um, we can also measure things like potentially 
uh, dark matter. So if dark matter is some very lightweight particle that has a very long wavelength because of the um, particle wave duality of matter, uh, these uh, dark matter particles could have very long wavelengths and could produce a gravitational field that oscillates in, in strength across, across our galaxy. We can observe those with pulsars as well. So there's all kinds of exotic physics um, from these and perhaps even probing the very, very early universe before the inflation period. Um, there's just so much we can look at. And I expect unknowns because I'm sure that we didn't think about everything that can produce gravitational waves in these pulsar timing data sets. So I'm really excited for the signal to grow with time and find something that we didn't expect. When was the last time do you think we've had this kind of a, a breakthrough uh, in, in our instrumentation that allows us to finally start asking bigger questions or, and start answering old questions and answering and asking new ones? Like one of those pivot points in, in astrophysics history. When was the last time we had something of this scale? Look, gravitational waves are really a a new window into the universe, right? It's not it's not electromagnetic waves um, that we're observing. It could be like uh, the discovery of radio waves from from space. So we look. used to look at look at the universe with optical telescopes. So we would just you know use the light that we can see with our eyes, just with lenses and mirrors, and we take photos of galaxies and things. And then all of a sudden, we measure radio waves from the universe as well. And when we look into that, we discover things like pulsars and we um, discover things like radio galaxies, um, which are these uh, active galactic nuclei. They're the black holes that are spewing out huge amounts of energy. We see them in radio waves, right? And so we opened this new window into the universe and we made a whole bunch of discoveries led to a lot of Nobel Prizes and lots of cool new physics. And then the same happened again when we discovered gamma rays from the universe and X-rays from the universe. And, and then we discovered neutrinos and cosmic particles where you know, high energy phenomena in the universe they produce these really energetic particles that slam into the upper atmosphere and then explode <laughs> and produce a whole bunch of new particles which then explode and creates this shower of particles that we measure on the surface of the Earth to trace back and study the particle that formed them, right? It's incredible. And so gravitational waves are a new window. Um, and it's on par with all of those discoveries where we make these sudden leaps. And in the future, we'll take for granted just gravitational wave astronomy. We'll just say, oh yeah, that's, that's normal now. Um, it's starting to get that way in, in LIGO now. They're starting to fourth observing run and there's just binary black holes crashing into each other all the time and it's just normal <laughs> um but in 2015 that was incredible it was the first time and so we've opened a new window to study the universe and um that's just really exciting well would you go back to your lab what would be an exciting un unexpected moment for you first of all if we see something unexpected or something that seems strange uh as scientists we meet that with a healthy dose of skepticism <laughs> and we we say okay that's that's weird we try to explain it every other way that we that we can before mm -hmm. we arrive to the conclusion okay this is something this is something special some discoveries you can immediately see them and you know that there's something special there i personally haven't made one of those discoveries yet but um, I know uh, colleagues of mine um, have made made such discoveries and it can be clear that there's something special happening. With this pulsar data and the search for gravitational waves, this background was expected to grow very slowly with time. And so in that sense, we never had a, a time where we arrived in the office and we're like, whoa. True, look that's at true. <laughs> gravitational waves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, 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 built, uh, it built with time and... Uh, yeah, yeah that so in that sense, we were just slowly working towards it. And in fact, um, the Pulsar Timing Array collaborations around the world were in communication with each other saying that, hey, we're starting to see something special and we all coordinated. So these 
this um, uh, this evidence that was announced uh, late June, um, it was a simultaneous publication from the North American group Nanograv, the European and Indian pulsar timing arrays, the Chinese pulsar timing array, and our group in Australia, the Parkes pulsar timing array. We published all simultaneously because we saw that something exciting was happening and we wanted to keep each other in the loop. Um, but that's not always going to be the case. There are going to be these times where we observe or we arrive at the office and we suddenly, you know, find something exciting in our data. And that's just part of the thrill of being a scientist where you don't know when these things are going to happen. And there are these moments where you can just be working away and suddenly there's an exciting discovery and you know that you're the first person in the history of humanity to know something that's now staring you in the face. Wow. Talk about, talk about a, a journey in creativity. It was the, from the question of when I drop this thing and it falls to the ground, why to coming up with a theory of why that, I mean, you're talking about generations and generations and centuries of scientists building on a body of knowledge to answer that question. And we just came to uh, an answer to the what became the theory uh, just recently, right? We, we hit a milestone and uh, really an end to that question in a way with the LIGO, the, the laser interferometer <laughs> gravitational wave observatory. Yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. <laughs> yeah. It was, and, and given the, in the history of science, science and, 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 specifically gravity science. I mean, it was an amazing time to be alive to watch that happen. That's an amazing place to end because it, it occurs to me that this whole journey uh, to answer this question about, about gravity really in some ways began with Galileo. You remember with the, mm -hmm. the, he, he took the, the two spheres of different sizes to the top of the tower of Pisa and dropped them at the same time because before Galileo did this experiment, everybody assumed that larger things fell faster and harder, right? That um, there, there was, if there was more mass, there was more stuff to fall to the earth. So it's going to go faster. And he proved that two spheres of the same size hit the ground at the same time. Therefore, there is some constant pulling against mass at the same rate at all times, that there is something to be discovered here. Right. And that's, yeah. that's one of, one of the amazing things that, that, that Galileo gave us one of the amazing questions. And what's funny is that wasn't Isaac Newton born the day after Galileo died? G Galileo was born, uh, was, was first, he was, uh, 1564, but yes, you're right. He died in 40, 1642 and Newton was born in 1643. Um, but again, there was, and also Galileo was able to cut, was also able to describe the acceleration of gravity. He also uh, slowed gravity down by rolling it down some inclined planes so that you could take measurements. And he was able to get, uh, uh, come up with the number, the acceleration of gravity, which is, I want to say like three point something feet per second squared. Oh no, I'm not going to remember that. One difference between the two, Newton was an introverted weirdo. And you know that I can talk <laughs> about Newton for a long time, about how strange he was. And, you know, he didn't really get along with, he didn't hang out with people. He wasn't social. Uh, he invented calculus to solve a personal problem and didn't tell anyone about that either. <laughs> Um, and then when someone asked him, you know, hey, did uh, how did you figure this out? He said, oh, I invented a new mathematics. And they said, what? <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, I did it. I did it a while back at home. I did it in my garage. And, and they're like, well, we would like to know about this. And he was like, oh, give me a minute. And instead of taking a minute, it took him like 10 years and he wrote the entire Principia. <laughs> <laughs> to summarize basically like you know what i should probably write this down those those 16th century italian garages man they're yeah. they're, they're a hotbed of creativity well he so newton was a strange was a strange one galileo 
would have gotten his message out a lot better than Newton because he was kind of a salesman. I mean, oh he, yeah, he and that's and ended up being what got him in trouble is that he liked to talk about these things to people and he was kind of a big mouth, I think. And he was told over and over again by the Vatican to stop it, and he did it anyway. Have you ever read his uh, address to the Holy See when he was called yes. before them the first time? I yeah. mean, it is the most biting. I mean, it, it totally stands up. I mean, you could have written it about fundamentalism today. It is the most biting, the most sarcastic, the most caustic, vitriolic <laughs> takedown of fundamentalism I've ever seen. Yeah. And that's really important, actually, to, to understand, you know, what happened to him, because on one hand, I mean, it was still authoritative, uh, you know, religious power that, you know, put him under house arrest for the rest of his life. Yeah. But <laughs> and it wasn't really it wasn't really even fundamentalism. Fundamentalism. It was well, anti. Right, right. It was the anti science crowd. Yes. Which is now. <laughs> which has not changed. But here's the thing. And I. Well, I mean, this subject is about gravity. If we're not going to have this conversation now, then when are we ever going to have this conversation about gravity? Um, <laughs> he, the, the Vatican knew that this was not what what he was saying. They are the Vatican had their own very learned scholars. They, they knew that it was we were in a heliocentric uh, solar system. They knew Copernicus was probably right. What they didn't like was that information being leaked out to the public from some source other than the Vatican. Mm -hmm. And there were multiple moments where the Pope himself took a long walks in the garden with Galileo and said, hey, I we know, we agree, but could yeah. you not? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure he said it like that, but in Italian, so it was even cooler. Um, so, yeah, but you kind of get a sense that Galileo from but the, from uh, his letter to you know during his trial you get the sense that he was locked up not just for heresy but for being kind of a pain in the ass <laughs> um and i think it's more the latter <laughs> I, I, I think yeah it was heresy but they were like you know we've told him you've told you not to do this over and over and over again and you keep yeah. doing it and then at your trial you insult this okay that's it <laughs> the well is produced recorded and edited by brandon edgens and anson mount special thanks to daniel reardon for taking the time to try to explain this to us theme music for the well was composed by jonathan myberg and performed by brandon edgens additional music for this episode by brandon edgens thank you for listening and have a great week.